Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 509. Meanwhile, back at the ship. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. Thank you for letting me go to MapCon, which is now going to be called IPC, Independent Podcasting Conference. Uh, it was lovely. Every year it gets lovelier. I met some really incredible people who I will be sharing kind of gradually over time, but not this week because this week's episode is going to be big. There is so much happening. And if you are on Facebook, you might have caught me. I did a Facebook Live from the podcast conference. And then I also did a Facebook Live from my work in a phone booth. (laughs) So you got to see that. And that was to announce that I was going to have to skip that one week because these three chapters that we are about to face together are vast, not in length so much as in the amount of action that Robert Louis Stevenson smashed into them. I even said to Andrew this morning, it's like he sped up. It's like the film is speeding up and so much is happening so quickly. I have had the hardest time figuring out how to get everything to you that I think you would either need or appreciate about what's going on in the chapter. There's a lot of nautical terminology. There's a lot of slang. There's a lot of action. There's some really, I thought, interesting kinds of history are alluded to and went down several rabbit holes trying to find out more for you. I wasn't always successful, but at least I will share with you the misadventure of looking for that information. But the important thing is today's three chapters, 16, 17, and 18, this is the beginning of part four, the last part of the book. The, the three chapters today, the narrative is taken over by Dr. Livesey, thus the title of this episode. We've seen Jim. He's been off. He met Ben Gunn. It was nifty and and exciting and great. And now we have to find out what was happening back on the ship where our good guys, Livesey, Trelawney Smollett, and Trelawney's staff, the three servants that he brought with him, Red Ruth Hunter and Joyce, they have to figure out how not to get killed by the six pirates who are also on board with them, left behind, it looks kind of like, to babysit them. (sighs) So, exciting stuff. But before we do that, I wanted to share with you something so cool from one of our listeners in Denmark. This blew my mind. As you know, I've been kind of in a, a social media diet state for quite some time now, because there just aren't that many hours in the day. And I know that you understand that and and appreciate the, the situation I find myself in, and I thank you for that. At the podcast conference, I was able to actually take some time to dive back in and see what people had been saying. And one of the things I found was an email from August from a listener. And I need to share this with you. So this is a message I got from listener... Merite by Hinsel, and I hope I didn't butcher your name because it's beautiful. Merite is from Denmark, and she wrote this to me, and I think it is so cool. First, she says very nice things. Thank you for the podcast Craplet. I don't know how it is in America, but here in Denmark, hardly anyone reads classical literature anymore. I am heartbroken. Even at the universities, everybody is reading the latest and newest book, but I like the classics much better. Yay. C.S. Lewis said, 
We read to know that we are not alone, which is true, because you never feel alone in the company of a good book. So true. However, I do sometimes feel alone with my love of old books, which I feel only a few of my friends and acquaintances share. This is one of the reasons why I am in love with Craft Lit. It is such a joy to listen to, and I am impressed with both your knowledge of literature and enthusiasm for the classics. Enthusiasm, yes. And knowledge of literature is lots and lots of rabbit holes that I go down researching. <laughs> we left behind the books that I taught a long time ago, so everything's new to me too. It's just that I love researching stuff, and this gives me an excuse. I think my kids have finally come to terms with that. Anyway, that was all very nice and good, but what she really wrote to tell us, all of us, is this. I wrote to you because my family and I have a special history with Robert Louis Stevenson and his book, Treasure Island. It is my father's favorite book, and when I was a child, he made a board game based on the novel. Over the years, the game developed, and my sister and I became involved in it, drawing the characters and thinking up ways to translate the story into parts of the game. It now features characters like Jim, Livesey, Trelawney, Smollett, Silver, Arrow, Israel Hands, Blind Pew, Black Dog, Ben Gunn, and more. My father also did a new translation of the novel into Danish, which is no mean feat, as there are, as you will see in today's chapters, many nautical expressions and archaic words. But his translation got very good reviews, of which my father is naturally proud. As he should be, I cannot imagine having to try to translate this book into anything at all, even modern English. It would kill me. I'm so impressed. She goes on to say, recently the game was published, and I think it is even possible to purchase an English version of it, which I am regrettably not in possession of, but I am sending you here below a few pictures of the game and the book, which we have put into the show notes for you. Because how cool is this? Oh my gosh. It's like we're two degrees of separation away from greatness. This is so awesome. Just wait until you see the pictures. And if you live in or near Denmark, please buy this game and then let us know how it is to play. It looks like a lot of fun. It's really beautiful. So thank you for writing. This is so great, Merita. Um, I'm so blown away by the fact that your dad started this, very much like Robert Louis Stevenson started writing the book, hanging out with kids and making up stories with them, that your dad started this when you were a kid and had the commitment and stick to itness for all of you to get to a point where you have a complete thing that becomes a published game. I don't know about in Denmark, but I know that in the States, it's really hard to get this done. So congratulations on that. Congratulations on on your father's translation. That is amazing. And I bow before his superior intellect and language skills. Wow. Just so cool. The other thing that happened in the dead zone of, of the last couple of weeks is we got voicemails. So catching you up on the voicemails. Hi, Heather. This is Lise from Maryland. And I just listened to the Treasure Island episode, Dunning Meat Kruger. And I had a couple of comments. First of all, about the bread. Um, you talk about the humidity. What I wanted to ask was, did you proof the yeast? Because I think I had something similar happen with gluten-containing bread, and it turned out that the yeast was old. So um, that... It's just something that you might want to check for next time. And the other is a minor uh, correction for your discussion. You were talking about when Pew left the um, left the the inn. It wasn't Pew. It was Black Dog. Pew was the blind beggar. So Black Dog is the the gentleman gentleman who left the inn. Um, so that's it. And I'm enjoying the book. I have seen a couple of adaptations but never read it and um am really enjoying all the all the detail and roller coaster ride of expectation that he's taking us through and i think it's brilliant enjoying the book so glad to have you back number one i wanted to let lisa know that yes i did proof the yeast i'm neurotic about that having lived through a couple of non-proofed yeast disasters and yeah, I still have no idea. The yeast was bubbling away, eating sugar and farting. 
because that's what yeast is doing. Or burping, I guess, one or the two. Either way, I don't like to think about it too much. But the yeast was definitely active. Hi, Heather. It's Amy in Seattle. Uh, Amy crochets on Ravelry, A-I-M-E-E. And I'm loving Treasure Island, of course. Um, and I thought I would call in and talk a little bit about some of the nautical terms. Um, uh, I love medical history because my dad was a naval officer, and he's very much into naval history, both uh, fictional and non-fictional writing, especially the Royal Navy. Um, but I uh, wanted to uh, – I was concerned I was going to get a little pedantic, but then I realized, who am I thinking of here? This is Craftlet listeners. We love details. So, um, Boson, like you said, it's pronounced Boson. Cox Swain is also pronounced Coxon. And uh, you know, so think about C-O-X apostrophe N. Um, and one thing that you mentioned was that you'll often see scores with a coxswain in the boat helping them keep the rhythm, which is, it sounds like when you were talking about that, you were sort of referring to people who are row crew. Um, and I wanted to correct some common misconceptions about that. These days, modern history of rowing, if you see rowers and a coxswain in a boat together, they're almost never scholars. So there's two kinds of rowers. Uh, sculling and sweeping are the two kinds. Scholars are the ones you see racing with one or two or four people in the boat, and they've got two oars per person. So in each hand, they have a single oar over one side of the boat. When uh, you look at the rowers and you see that each rower is holding on to one longer oar that goes either over the port side or the starboard side, that's called sweeping. And so those folks aren't scholars. They're sweepers. Well, we don't call them sweepers, though. We call everyone rowers. And a coxswain is almost never in a schooling boat, at least in the U.S. anymore. Um, coxswains most commonly cox eights and fours of the sweet boats. And uh, they actually don't sit in the front of the boat. They sit in the stern, in the rear, facing forward, while the, co- the rowers sit backwards. Um, anyway, and what's funny is people um, – the, the, the other common misconception is that coxswains keep time, which is not particularly – it's one of the, the lesser things they do. Mostly they steer and they encourage and they yell a lot. <laughs> and uh, they remind us what to do when, to help win a race and they tell us who we are in, the, you know, in relation to the other boats on the course. So um, I just thought that might be interesting because there's a lot of, uh, like I said, common misconceptions out there about knowing – and uh, sculling. Uh, sculling is rowing, but rowing isn't necessarily sculling. It's a subset. So um, as you could probably guess, I am a rower, and it's an amazing sport. And uh, you can start at any age. So here's my plug, folks. If you want to try a new sport, go out and find a rowing team. Take care, and I'm looking forward to the rest of Treasure Island. Thanks, Heather. Bye. Amy, I am saying this to you up front. I guarantee you I am going to get something, if not several things, wrong in today's chapters, especially about nautical armaments. I have found nothing but contradictions in my research. So if you, Amy, or anybody else who's listening can correct us, that would be awesome. Because this is one of the rabbit holes I went down and my my family has watched me just kind of sadly shaking their heads thinking, oh, so sad to see her lose her mind like this. But ultimately, when I had Andrew read part of the text, he agreed with me, something ain't right. So I'll let you know when we hit that part. Anybody who has any information that can help us out, please share. 206-350-1642 is the number if you want to leave a voicemail. Otherwise, you can write in heather at craftlit.com. And Justin or I or both of us or either one of us will do our best to get any answer that you need to you, either here or there. All right. So, chapter 16. Chapter 16 is the first chapter that Dr. Livesey takes over the narration of. And yes, that was horrible preposition use on my part. I apologize. Moving on. The chapter is titled How the Ship Was Abandoned. This is one of those very Brechtian moments. It also, in some ways, to me, 
indicates a little bit about Dr. Livesey as a narrator. I have read some commentary talking about how Livesey is an excellent choice to take over these chapters that Jim Hawkins couldn't possibly have known anything about at the time. It keeps the plot going. It lets us know in more or less real time. We're rewinding a little bit to pretty much the point at which Jim wound up landing on the beach or almost almost to the point where he was landing on the beach with the pirates. So we've rewound, we're resetting our point of view. And some of these reviewers are very jazzed about Livesey. I have not had the same reaction. It's kind of funny. I've actually found a lot of commentary about these three chapters that I really don't agree with at all. And I can't tell if it's just me being stubborn or persnickety or old or that I actually have a leg to stand on. So I'm more than happy to have somebody correct me in this. But I find Livesey to be a, a little pompous in his commentary and a little sparse with some details. And he also gets some things wrong or at least sets us up for misunderstanding a couple of things. Now, that could be lazy writing on Robert Louis Stevenson's part. Absolutely. Totally could be. It could be that these are chapters that he just whipped off because they're very exciting and lots happens in them. And you can really feel quite literally the speed of the chapters increase as we, we move through this action. Great. Stevenson hasn't really made any mistakes yet that we found. And I know that this was originally serialized, as were so many books at the time, and it was serialized for young readers, which probably means that editorially, nobody was paying a whole lot of attention. I get that. Some of these mistakes went right by me the first two times that I read or listened to the chapters and then started to stand out because I had more time to pay less attention to simple plot and more attention to, well, wait, 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 wait. Now, let's go back and think about that for a minute. Many, many Craftlet listeners are much better first time through listeners than I am. So I wouldn't be surprised if you have some moments of cognitive dissonance. If you do, please note them and then see if you can figure out what's going on. If you have a different interpretation than I do, I would be, I would be fascinated to hear all the different points of view on this because I really do feel like the reviewers responses to these chapters are not craft lit listener responses. They are, you know, we've talked about it before. It's the, it's the people who feel like they're getting their masters in literature and need to use all the big words so that they can prove how smart they are when really we just want to really enjoy the book because it's a lot of fun and we want to know what the words mean when they're not using words that we use very often, like jolly boat. Here's one. We have a lot of words for these chapters. And as you know, I am usually loath to stop in the middle of a run. If we're going to watch a, a movie in class, when I was teaching, I often tried to rig things so that I could have the kids for two uninterrupted class periods back to back so that I could show them the, the film all in one sweep because it's miserable to have to stop a two hour movie every 37 minutes so that a bell can ring. And it really makes it hard to understand what's going on and follow plot and understand character and theme and subtext and all of that stuff. Similar here, often I have played chapters back to back. This entire book, we've had two chapters back to back. This episode's going to be different because chapter 16, I'm going to stop after it. Too much happens. Too many possible places to be confused, I think. I'll clarify some things and make sure that you have what you need for the next two chapters. And then I'll play chapter 17 and 18 back to back because they they dovetail together better, I think. And um, that's how we're going to play it today. So we need to start with refreshing our memories about our players, our cast of characters, because we've been with Jim and the Pirates, Long John, and then Ben Gunn. We've been with them for a little while. So now we go back to, as we know, Dr. Livesey, Captain Smollett, Squire Trelawney. Those are our three leads who are still on the ship, on the Hispaniola. Then we have Trelawney's three servants, who I mentioned earlier, and they are Hunter, 
who is one of Trelawney's servants, Red Ruth, who's the old gamekeeper. He's the one who read the letter with Jim and who was totally backing Squire Trelawney. Like, if he wants to tell people that we're hunting for treasure, I don't see why he didn't get to tell people that we're hunting for treasure. Back off, kid. And then there's Joyce, who is Trelawney's valet. And there have been comments made about him that, uh, you know, I guess he's pretty good for brushing off somebody's suit. But aside from that, I don't know what he can do. So we've got those six men, Livesey, Trelawney, Smollett, Hunter, Red Ruth, Joyce. Out of those six men, we know that Livesey is a competent surgeon slash medicine man slash thinker because he seems to be the brains of the operation on the non-sailing side. And Smollett, who is smart as a tack. I love Smollett. If I ever needed anyone to run my life, I am hiring Smollett. I, I really, I just love how this guy cuts through the fog and sees a way straight through. And it's like, nope, this is what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to get it done. Let's go. I love it. And you're going to see a lot more of that from him in today's chapters. So that's kind of fun. But we've only got six men. And then we've got Jim who's back on shore. We don't know if he's going to be okay by the time these guys catch up to him. And we've got this Ben Gunn guy. Again, we don't really, I mean, he was a pirate. He seems to be very desperate to get off the island and probably is going to be allied with whoever he can get to get him off the island. So we don't know if he's going to be a good guy for our guys or not. That's still a really small number of guys. But what we do know is that Livesey Trelawney Smollett Hunter, Red Ruth, and Joyce are on the ship with six pirates. So there were seven of them when Jim was there. Now there's six of them and six pirates. Even odds. They are not going to get into a fight with each other, number one, unless they have to. Number two, the pirates don't know that they know anything. So there's no reason for the pirate guys to attack the good guys at this point. So that's cool. They can just camp out and wait and see what's going to happen. And then, you know, decide something by the time that Long John and the other pirates in their gigs are come back. We don't know which way they're going to go yet. That's part of what we get to see in this chapter. Terms you are going to hear. Lily Bolero. This gets mentioned several times. It is, and I'm quoting from the footnote here because this really ticked me off, an Irish dance tune from 1689 by English composer Harry Purcell. We have read enough books on Craft Lib at this point to know that if, if groups of people are going to be insulted <laughs> in those archaic ways that we often see people insulted in old books, I mean, women, sure, that's kind of a given, but you're going to see Catholics insulted, you're going to see Jews insulted, or you're going to see the Irish insulted. Am I right or am I right? What group am I leaving out? Well, and occasionally, although not as often, because it wasn't as big a topic at the time, often you see things like what we saw with Long John Silver's wife, where he has a colored wife. And, you know, that doesn't really age well either. I mean, I suppose it's better than some of the other things that he could have said. But I really don't think Robert Louis Stevenson would have ever gone there. He's too interesting a guy to have done that. Even, even if you were trying to show that this guy was a bad guy, I think he'd do it other ways. So the reason I bring this up is because Sons 1 and 2 have a YouTube channel that they like. It is called Extra Credits, and they have an extra history portion of their channel. Extra History did the five-part breakdown of the potato Famine, and I'm putting famine in quotation marks because one of the things I learned from my father, who designed using Landsat satellite data and, you know, math and science and satellites, he, working with some other people, designed a famine early warning system. There are certain things that you can tick off on a piece of paper. If this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, you are going to have a famine. 98% of what it takes to have a famine has nothing at all to do with whether soil or farming. It's politics. It's stupid politics or evil politics, sometimes both. So when, when we say potato famine, it's not a famine. It was really, really dirty pool politics. 
And I have not seen as good, a, well, certainly not as good a cartoon version of the history, but I haven't seen as, as well-documented, well-researched, comprehensive, short explanation of how what happened happened and how horrifying it was uh, as this series of five, I don't know, 10, 15 minute videos. They also did one on World War I, where literally my entire life, I have thought, how could the guys who were fighting World War I be so stupid? I mean, who thought it was a good idea to dig a trench and then shoot at each other across a no man's land, never gaining territory, never losing territory, but losing a lot of men in the process? I mean, what are you, what's the point? What are you fighting for? Wow, I learned by watching Extra History. So links to the potato famine, quote unquote, you will find a link to that playlist in the show notes. I'm also giving you a link to all of the playlists so that you can see all of the things that they've covered. They've done Joan of Arc. They've done World War I. They've done Bismarck. They've, done, they've just done a ton. And it's, it's all really good. And they pick some really interesting things because they allow their viewers to encourage them uh, in one direction or the other. So one of them is the most famous pirate queen. Did you know that there was a pirate queen at one point in history? I did not. Did you know that she was Chinese? I didn't know that either. Did you know that she was amazing? Nope, me either. Now I do. Because of extra credits history. So there's lots of fun stuff there. Total weird side jaunt, I know. But the Irish, I'm putting that in bold italics right now, the Irish dance tune written by English composer Harry Purcell. Henry Purcell could have been the most Irish sympathetic person in the world. I have no idea. It was the way the footnote was written that just irked me. Plus, with all of the Brexit Irish backstop stuff going on right now, I was sensitive, I think. Overly sensitive? Probably. But still, you're going to enjoy the videos. So there it is. So Lily Valero is an Irish dance tune written by an Englishman that you will hear. And you will hear it because Justin is awesome and went and found it for you. So there's the Lily Valero. We have two different kinds of boats that are not the Hispaniola. We have gigs, which are long, light ships' boats that are stored up against the flanks of the boat. So you'd lower them on pulleys down into the water. There is also something called a jolly boat, spelled like you think, J-O-L-L-Y dash B-O-A-T. The jolly boat was usually carried on the stern. And if you had one of those ships that had kind of the, the top part of the stern kind of sat out over the edge of the rest of the boat underneath it, it could have been stored under there, or that could have been where one would go to relieve themselves so as to not get it all over the side of the ship. It depends. It depends on whose ship it was. <laughs> it depends on who was designing it. It depends on when it happened. I've found, like I said, lots of contradictory stuff about sailing at this time. Paling. P-A-L-I-N-G. A fence made of pails. These are also sometimes called pickets. But a paling fence is a fence made out of boards, often whitewashed or pale because they've been unfinished. So they're not dark wood, they're pale wood. And they usually have uh, pointed stakes at the top. So deer aren't going to be stupid enough to jump over them. And hopefully humans aren't going to be either. Beyond the pale <laughs> would mean going beyond that fenced area and into a potentially dangerous zone because why else would you have spiky pointed tops on your pails, your paling fence, if you weren't trying to keep something in or something out? I'm going to go with something out. So paling fence, that's what it is. You're going to hear one of the strangest colloquialisms, idiomatic phrases that I think I've ever come across that makes perfect sense in retrospect, but and it's kind of perfect that it's in here. It's dot and carry one. You will hear somebody saying, my pulse went dot and carry one. 
because he was scared. We can understand that this probably means it's the same as my heart skipped a beat. That makes perfect sense too. Except Dot and Carry One makes me first off think Morse code, which is totally inappropriate. And then and Carry One makes me think math from third grade. So now I'm really confused. It turns out it is uh, somewhat nautical in its origin. It's pre-Victorian. It is when somebody had a wooden leg and they are ambling in some direction, they go dot, put down the peg leg, and carry one, swing their regular leg around because they have to kind of pivot on the peg leg instead of propelling themselves the way you would with a foot that can bend. This went to uh, from uh, ocean-going things that it would be very hard to walk across the deck of a ship with a peg leg if the ship were rolling, rolling and pitching because of the, the weather. It also could have been related to insults that were made to dancing teachers who weren't particularly light on their feet, that they, they looked like a dot and carry one, somebody who couldn't quite get the beat right, also does apply to math because there's carrying and borrowing and putting the, the dots above the columns of characters, depending on what kind of math you're doing. And all of that together equals, yeah, there's lots of different ways you could look at it, but ultimately it comes down to your heart skipped a beat or limped funny. It did something odd that wasn't the way it was supposed to have been done. That's what that means. So it's kind of interesting. It makes me think that Robert Louis Stevenson must have spent a lot of time in pubs listening to people older than him and just if he wasn't taking notes, he was just soaking it up because it seems like he really did actually acquire an awful lot of lingo that was not of his generation at all. A lot of what I'm finding definitely is coming out of the late 1700s, not out of the late 1800s, which is kind of cool. He's just good. A painter, painter, P-A-I-N-T-E-R, like somebody who paints your house. In nautical terminology, a painter is a rope that would be attached to the bow of a boat, little boat or big boat, for tying it to a dock or tying it to a ship or for towing it. And you remember not too long ago that the pirates all had to get into the gigs and the jolly boat and row the boat around the edge of the island, pulling it towing it from those painter ropes, which could not have been fun. Two fathoms and a half. A fathom is about six feet. So two fathoms and a half is about 15 feet. You're going to hear a phrase, don't hang so long in the stays. So there are lots of ways that I thought this made sense, and they all do. Don't hang so long in the stays. If you're in a stockade where you're actually being constrained, like on a pillory, that would make sense. Don't hang so long in stays for women, with stays being part of the corset. I can totally understand that too. But in this case, stays or irons, this phrase is something that is said about ships that are sailing into the wind with no way on. This is if a ship fails to come about so that they can catch the wind again. It means you're, you've stayed too long. You have waited and now you are out of luck. This is not going to end well for you. And it absolutely means exactly that in this first chapter, chapter 16. So, whew, that was a lot. I know. All right, let's listen to chapter 16. I hope I gave you what you needed. And here we go. Part four. The Stockade. Chapter 16. Narrative continued by the Doctor. How the ship was abandoned. It was about half past one, three bells in the sea phrase, that the two boats went ashore from the Hispaniola. The captain, the squire, and I were talking matters over in the cabin. Had there been a breath of wind, we should have fallen on the six mutineers who were left aboard with us, slipped our cable, and away to sea. But the wind was wanting and to complete our helplessness, down came Hunter with the news that Jim Hawkins had slipped into a boat 
and was gone ashore with the rest. It had never occurred to us to doubt Jim Hawkins, but we were alarmed for his safety. With the men in the temper they were in, it seemed an even chance if we should see the lad again. We ran on deck. The pitch was bubbling in the seams. The nasty stench of the place turned me sick. If ever a man smelled fever and dysentery, it was in that abominable anchorage. The six scoundrels were sitting, grumbling, under a sail in the forecastle. Ashore we could see the gigs had made fast, and a man sitting in each, hard by where the river runs in. One of them was whistling Lily Bolero. Waiting was a strain, and it was decided that Hunter and I should go ashore with the jolly boat in quest of information. The gigs had leaned to their right, but Hunter and I pulled straight in, in the direction of the stockade upon the chart. The two who were left guarding their boats seemed in a bustle at our appearance. Lily Bolero stopped off, and I could see the pair discussing what they ought to do. Had they gone and told Silver, all might have turned out differently. But they had their orders, I suppose, and decided to sit quietly where they were, and hark back again to Lily Bolero. There was a slight bend in the coast, and I steered so as to put it between us. Even before we had landed we had thus lost sight of the gigs. I jumped out and came as near running as I durst, with a big silk handkerchief under my hat for coolness' sake, and a brace of pistols ready primed for safety. I had not gone a hundred yards when I came on the stockade. This was how it was. A spring of clear water arose at the top of a knoll. Well, on the knoll, and enclosing the spring, they had clapped a stout log-house, fit to hold two score people in a pinch, and loopholed for musketry on every side. All around this they had cleared a wide space, and then the thing was completed by a paling six feet high, without door or opening, too strong to pull down without time and labour, and too open to shelter the besiegers. The people in the log-house had them in every way. They stood quiet in the shelter, and shot the others like partridges. All they wanted was a good watch and food, for, short of a complete surprise, they might have held the place against a regiment. What particularly took my fancy was the spring, for though we had a good place of it, the cabin of the Hispaniola, with plenty of arms and ammunition, and things to eat, and excellent wines, there was one thing overlooked. We had no water. I was thinking this over when there came, ringing over the island, the cry of a man at the point of death. I was not new to violent death. I have served His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland, and got a wound myself at Fontenoy. But I know my pulse went jot and carry one. Jim Hawkins is gone, was my first thought. It is something to have been an old soldier, but more still to have been a doctor. There is no time to dilly-dally in our work, and so now I made up my mind instantly, and with no time lost returned to the shore and jumped on board the jolly boat. By good fortune Hunter pulled a good oar. We made the water fly, and the boat was soon alongside and I aboard the schooner. I found them all shaken, as was natural. The squire was sitting down as white as a sheet, thinking of the harm he had led us to, the good soul and one of the six forecastle hands was little better. "'There's a man,' said Captain Smollett, nodding towards him, "'new to this work. He came nigh-hand fainting, doctor, when he heard the cry, another touch of the rudder, and that man would join us.' I told my plan to the captain, and between us we settled on the details of its accomplishment. We put old Redruth in the gallery between the cabin and the forecastle, with three or four loaded muskets and a mattress for protection. Hunter brought the boat round under the stern port, and Joyce and I set to work loading her with powder, tins, muskets, bags of biscuit, kegs of pork, a cask of cognac, and my invaluable medicine chest. In the meantime the squire and the captain stayed on the deck and the latter hailed the coxswain, who was the principal man aboard. "'Mr. Hands,' he said, "'there are two of us with a brace of pistols each. If any one of you six make a signal of any description, that man's dead.' 
they were a good deal taken back, and after a little consultation, one and all tumbled down the fore companion, thinking, no doubt, to take us on the rear. But when they saw Red Ruth waiting for them in the sparred gallery, they went about ship at once, and a head popped out again on deck. "'Down, dog!' cried the captain. And the head popped back again, and we heard no more for the time of these six very faint-hearted seamen. By this time, tumbling things in as they came, we had the jolly boat loaded as much as we dared. Joyce and I got out through the stern port, and we made for shore again as fast as oars could take us. This second trip fairly aroused the watchers along shore. Lily Bolero was dropped again, and just before we lost sight of them behind the little point, one of them whipped ashore and disappeared. I had half a mind to change my plan and destroy their boats, but I feared that Silver and the others might be close at hand, and all might very well be lost by trying for too much. We had soon touched land in the same place as before, and set to work to provision the blockhouse. All three made the first journey, heavily laden, and tossed our stores over the palisade. Then, leaving Joyce to guard them, one man to be sure, but with half a dozen muskets, Hunter and I returned to the jolly boat and loaded ourselves once more. So we proceeded, without pausing to take breath, till the whole cargo was bestowed, when the two servants took up their position in the blockhouse, and I, with all my powder, sculled back to the Hispaniola. That we should have risked a second boat load seems more daring than it really was. They had the advantage of numbers, of course, but we had the advantage of arms. Not one of the men ashore had a musket, and before they could get within range for pistol-shooting, we flattered ourselves we should be able to give a good account of a half-dozen at least. The squire was waiting for me at the stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He caught the painter and made it fast, and we fell to loading the boat for our very lives. Pork, powder, and biscuit was the cargo, with only a musket and a cutlass apiece for Squire and me, and Red Ruth and the captain. The rest of the arms and powder we dropped overboard in two fathoms and a half of water, so that we could see the bright steel shining far below us in the sun on the clean, sandy bottom. By this time the tide was beginning to ebb, and the ship was swinging round to her anchor. Voices were heard faintly hallowing in the direction of the two gigs, and though this reassured us for Joyce and Hunter, who were well to the eastward, it warned our party to be off. Redruth retreated from his place in the gallery and dropped into the boat, which we then brought round to the ship's counter to be handier for Captain Smollett. "'Now, men,' said he, "'do you hear me?' There was no answer from the forecastle. "'It's to you, Abraham Gray, it's to you I am speaking.' Still no reply. "'Gray,' resumed Mr. Smollett, a little louder, "'I am leaving this ship, and I order you to follow your captain. I know you are a good man at bottom, and I dare say not one of the lot of you as bad as he makes out. I have my watch here in my hand. I give you thirty seconds to join me in. Come, my fine fellow, continued the captain, don't hang so long in stays. I'm risking my life and the lives of these good gentlemen every second. There was a sudden scuffle, a sound of blows, and out burst Abraham Gray with a knife cut on the side of the cheek, and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. "'I'm with you, sir,' he said and the next moment he and the captain had dropped aboard of us, and we had shoved off and given way. We were clear out of the ship, but not yet ashore in our stockade. End of chapter 16 Okay, starting from the beginning of the chapter, what have we learned? We've learned that Dr. Livesey has really enjoyed appropriating nautical language. Yay! So there's that. The pitch was bubbling in the seams. So the seams between the planks of the deck of the ship, the pitch that was sealing it and making it watertight, it was so hot that it was bubbling. Yikes. So later when Smollett has a line where he says it'll be a hot run, which you'll hear in the next chapters, he is not kidding at all. 
and it's humid and that hot, which also means rowing in that kind of heat and humidity. So, wow. We have learned that Lily Bolero is one of the favorite songs of some of these pirates because it keeps coming up. We've learned that Livesey is not an idiot in a fight. He runs up to the stockade with his brace of pistols, two pistols, ready primed. They're already primed. They're ready to shoot. Remember, these are not automatically loading weapons. These take time. If you've never seen the movie Glory, I know I've mentioned this before, there is a scene with Denzel Washington and Matthew Broderick where Broderick is trying to prove to Denzel and all of the other new recruits that it is really hard to load a musket under pressure. Muskets don't have rifling in them. They don't have the spiral grooves in the barrels on the inside. Neither do these pistols that Livesey has. So these things are both slow to load, inaccurate as uh, aimable weapons, and they're firing, in the case of the pistols, they're most likely firing lead, same with the musket. Larger guns were not shooting lead, they would be shooting iron, because something like lead in a bigger gun with more powder behind it would be more likely to melt and have less of an impact if it hit like the side of your ship. So you'd want to use something harder and more stable, like iron. We have learned the layout of the stockade. The outside is loopholed for musketry, so there are holes that you can put muskets through so that you don't put yourself, you you don't expose yourself to being shot quite so much. We know that there's a six-foot-high paling fence around it. We know that there is fresh water, and we have learned from Dr. Livesey that on the Hispaniola, they are out of fresh water, or they don't have enough fresh water. It's hard to know because, like I said, Livesey starts speeding up in his narration. These are the kind of things that Jim actually took the time to tell us about. Livesey's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's that. I just figured out we didn't have any water. Moving on. We know that he was a soldier. We know that he has gotten a wound himself, so he knows how badly it hurts to be shot. And that is no joke. We also know that he is no slacker. When the pressure is on, this man moves and moves very quickly. He is not ashamed to go rowing a boat by himself if he needs to. These are all great things. We learned rather cryptically from Smollett that he thinks that there is another sailor on board who might join them. This was not a thousand percent clear. He said, there's a man new to this work. He came nigh hand fainting, doctor, when he first heard the cry, when he heard the same guy that Jim heard getting killed by the pirates on shore. He came nigh hand fainting, another touch of the rudder, and that man would join us. If we just push him a little bit more, he's going to leave the other group of six pirates and come with us. So that's news. They put Red Ruth in the gallery. That's the back part of the boat underneath. In the front part of the boat is where the pirate group is. Then Joyce, Hunter, and Livesey get to work loading the jolly boat. Hunter brings it around to the back. Joyce and Livesey start loading in bags of biscuits, kegs of pork, a cask of cognac, because of course, and my invaluable medicine chest, which is super important. During all that time, Trelawney and the captain are up on deck, and they hailed Israel Hands. And Smollett says, which I love, here are two of us with a brace of pistols each. If any one of you six make a signal of any description, that man is dead. It's like if you signal the guys on land, so help me, you're never breathing another breath. I think these guys know Smollett well enough to know that he is not making this up or being hyperbolic, that this is, this would be bad. So they were surprised. Remember, they had no idea that anybody else knew what they were up to. They all run downstairs. This is like this is like a Keystone Cops movie. They run downstairs. They run towards the back. They see Red Ruth armed with guns. They run back to the front, and uh, one head pops out of the hold. Smollett yells, down, dog, and the head pops back down because they are not going to play this game. And Livesey calls them six very faint-hearted seamen, which... You know he had to have fun being able to write that. 
fictional character or not, that had to be fun for Stevenson, if not for a real Livesey. So Hunter is in the boat. He's been the one on the oars the whole time that they were loading it. Joyce and Livesey join him. They whip back to the stockade. They hustle their buns to unload everything, get all of the stuff that they brought into the the palisade, into the, the stockade on the palisade. And then Hunter and he goes back to the jolly boat one more time, getting the very, very last of everything. And then he leaves Hunter and Joyce at the stockade, two men there. He left Joyce there just for a little while. But when he leaves to go back to Hispaniola, he leaves Hunter and Joyce there. There is lots of discussion about this. And it is confusing because Livesey is going back and forth between characters very quickly. But it is correct. Stevenson did not make a mistake here. Just in case you lost the thread too, the way I did in the beginning, Stevenson did it right. And then Livesey says, he, with all his powers, sculled back to the Hispaniola. Go Livesey, man. He's getting a workout. I also love the image of him running with the silk handkerchief, probably wet silk handkerchief, on top of his head under his hat when he was running to the stockade the first time. Then, I love this change. When Livesey gets back, after Smollett and Trelawney have scared the pirates into staying below decks, and Redruth is in the back, so he knows that they aren't getting into the powder and the munitions, because where did Smollett force them to put it? In the back, under the galley. There's no way that the pirates can get at it, because Smollett's smart. So this time, when Livesey gets back to the ship, he says, the squire was waiting for me at the stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He is on it. Trelawney, who has been such an annoyance, so deeply annoying all this time, has his way clear. He is now about to be very, very useful. No joke. So everybody is now engaged. They are ready. They are going he catches the painter. They keep just what they can carry, everything else. They've wrapped up and they drop it overboard in two fathoms and a half, 15 feet of water so that we could see the bright steel shining far below in the sun on the clean sandy bottom. In theory, they would be able to come back and get this stuff. They just want to make sure, number one, they know where it is. Number two, the pirates don't. So bold move. Smart move. Most of these things are actually sealed, so it should be okay. We can assume that the arms and powder are sealed up tight, either in tins or wrapped in oil cloth, some, some way to keep it more or less watertight. And here's the problem. And Livesey doesn't make a big deal about it, but Livesey wasn't paying that much attention to Silver. Remember when Silver was navigating them around... And he said the ebb scours the beach. It scours the, the sides of the, the channels. The ebb flow off this island is very strong. So when Dr. Livesey says, by this time the tide was beginning to ebb and the ship was stringing around to her anchor, we should know that's probably a bad thing. Because it's, it's like going swimming someplace where there's a really, really strong undertow. It looks fine. It looks, it looks like water. It looks like the ocean. Meh. But then you get into it and suddenly you're sucked down and you're dead. So this is a, a bit of a warning that if you have been paying attention to things like that, you just got a heads up on it. And then we have a scene that I just love. It's so cinematic, I think. Smollett on deck. Everybody else is in the jolly boat. They're like, come on, we got to go. Let's get in the boat. And he stands there and says, Amen, do you hear me? And he's talking to the pirates. No answer. Silence. It is to you, Abraham Gray. It is to you that I am speaking. <laughs> I can't imagine a more awkward moment to have your name called out than when you are the one honest guy in a ship's hold surrounded by pirates. And then he says, I order you to follow your captain. I know you're a good man at bottom. I'm giving you 30 seconds. Nothing happens. Don't hang so long in the stays. Don't becalm yourself there. Don't wait so long that you can't get out of this. 
I'm risking my life and the lives of these good gentlemen every second. There's a fight. Out pops Gray. Awesome. I am with you, sir. And they go. Now, I have seen some people commenting that Robert Louis Stevenson is insulting Gray here by saying that the the line he he outbursts Abraham Gray with a knife cut on the side of his cheek and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. People have said, well, that's kind of insulting. I mean, comparing him to a dog. And I'm thinking, no, that's that would be a metaphor if you said he is a dog responding to a whistle. That would make me go, ooh, I don't know that he's really a dog. But like a dog to the whistle makes me think this is somebody who is so relieved and happy. Like a dog's been away from family and friends and people who love the dog and they hear the whistle and, oh my gosh, yay, I get to come with you again. Yay, this is awesome. Not so much subservient and meek as really glad to be part of the team again and relieved. So that's one of the places where I just diverged from some of the literary criticism that I saw. And also, again, one of those places where I thought maybe that's a modern ear versus an older, weirder ear. You know, we we have read a lot of old books and seen how things like this get described. And we can tell when they're meant to be bad, I think. I think we've gotten a pretty good ear about that stuff. Of course, I would, wouldn't I? Ha! <laughs> that's why I said 206-350-1642. If you have a comment, call and let us know. All right. That gets us to the end of this chapter. That was a lot of complicated and potentially confusing plot. But we also got some really interesting characterization going here. Smollett is more than willing to allow somebody a second chance, which I think is kind of cool for somebody who seems as stern and strict as him. Love that. Trelawney, when all is said and done and the gauntlet is thrown, dude steps up. He wasn't sitting there blubbering like a baby, which is what I would have expected, letting everybody do the work for him. He was there. He caught the rope. He helped get the ship stocked. He's on board. He's ready to go. Fabulous. Livesey, Rockin', Redruth, ever the good gamekeeper, is probably a good guy to keep around at this point because I would imagine he's good with a gun, being a gamekeeper. I'm just thinking. And they've added one to their group which is great. And Abraham Gray, if you don't remember, he was the carpenter's mate back in the beginning. We found that out. So not only a good guy and a guy who's willing to get hurt for his convictions and probably hoping that it'll save his life, but also a useful guy to have around. So that's good too. All right. Things to know for the next couple of chapters. A galley pot is a a small jar, usually glazed. You've seen this in uh, pictures or period dramas. You often see these as containers for medicine in chemists in like Victorian and pre-Victorian. Yeah, costume dramas. You see that. The gunnel was lipping astern. The gunnel is the upper edge of the side of the boat. It is spelled gunwale. It is pronounced gunnel. So I am told. That is the upper edge of the a boat, especially a little boat. You don't want water coming over the gunnel. So if it's lipping astern, it means the water is coming very close to the top edge. Like there's the the surface tension problem. If that surface tension breaks, that's going to be water in the boat. That's going to be bad. Trim the boat. To trim the boat would be shifting cargo or people using you as ballast to keep the vessel upright. So if one very heavy person is leaning to the right. Everybody else has to lean to the left. You're going to see this happening in the next couple chapters. Carpet bowls. This is like lawn bowling, but bowling on carpets, an indoor game. where you have a weighted ball and little pins that you can knock down. If you were very close to the pins, it would be very easy to knock them down with a ball. Especially, she's putting emphasis on it, a weighted ball. And don't forget the weaponry that they have, both sides have access to, is non-explosive. 
nothing explodes. It's just really heavy, and it can knock giant holes in humans and wooden things. All right, here are chapters 17 and 18 of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Yay! Chapter 17 Narrative continued by the Doctor The Jolly Boat's Last Trip This fifth trip was quite different from any of the others. In the first place, the little galley part of a boat that we were in was gravely overloaded. Five grown men, and three of them, Trelawney, Red Ruth, and the captain, over six feet high, was already more than she was meant to carry. Add to that the powder, pork, and the bread bags. The gunwales were lipping astern. Several times we shipped a little water, and my breeches and the tails of my coat were all soaking wet before we had got a hundred yards. The captain made us trim the boat, and we got her to lie a little more evenly. All the same, we were afraid to breathe. In the second place the ebb was now making, a strong, rippling current running westward through the basin, and then southward and seaward down the straits by which we had entered in the morning. Even the ripples were a danger to our overloaded craft, but the worst of it was that we were swept out of our true course, and away from our proper landing-place behind the point. If we let the current have its way we should come ashore beside the gigs where the pirates might appear at any moment. "'I cannot keep her head for the stockade, sir,' said I to the captain. I was steering, while he and Red Ruth, two fresh men, were at the oars. "'The tide keeps washing her down. Could you pull a little stronger?' "'Not without swamping the boat,' said he. "'You must bear up, sir, if you please, bear up, until you see your gaining.' I tried, and found by experiment that the tide kept sweeping us westward till I had laid her head due east, or just about right angles to the way we ought to go. "'We'll never get ashore at this rate,' said I. "'If it's the only course we can lie, sir, we must even lie it,' returned the captain. "'We must keep upstream, you see, sir,' he went on. "'If once we drop to leeward of the landing-place, it's hard to say where we should get ashore, besides the chance of being boarded by the gigs, whereas the way we go the current must slacken, and then we can dodge back along the shore. "'The current's less already, sir,' said the man Grey, who was sitting in the foresheets. "'You can ease her off a bit.' "'Thank you, my man,' said I, as if nothing had happened for we had all quietly made up our minds to treat him like one of ourselves. Suddenly the captain spoke up again, and I thought his voice was a little changed. "'The gun!' said he. "'I have thought of that,' said I, for I made sure he was thinking of a bombardment of the fort. "'They could never get the gun ashore, and if they did, they could never haul it through the woods.' "'Look astern, doctor,' replied the captain. We had entirely forgotten the long nine, and there, to our horror, were the five rogues busy about her, getting off her jacket, as they called the stout tarpaulin cover under which she sailed. Not only that, but it flashed into my mind at the same moment that the round shot and the powder for the gun had been left behind, and the stroke of an axe would put it all into the possession of the evil ones aboard. "'Israel was Flint's gunner,' said Gray, hoarsely. At any risk we put the boat's head directly for the landing-place. By this time we had got so far out of the run of the current that we kept steerage-way even at our necessarily gentle rate of rowing, and I could keep her steady for the goal. But the worst of it was that, with the course I now held, we turned our broadside instead of our stern to the Hispaniola, and offered a target like a barn door. I could hear, as well as see, that brandy-faced rascal, Israel Hands, plumping down a round shot on the deck. "'Who's the best shot?' asked the captain. "'Mr. Trelawney, out and away,' said I. "'Mr. Trelawney, will you please pick me off one of those men, sir? Hands, if possible,' said the captain. 
Trelawney was as cold as steel. He looked to the priming of his gun. "'Now,' cried the captain, "'easy with that gun, sir, or you'll swamp the boat. All hands stand by to trim her when he aims.' The squire raised his gun, the rowing ceased, and we leaned over to the other side to keep the balance, and all was so nicely contrived that we did not ship a drop. They had the gun by this time slewed around upon the swivel, and Hans, who was at the muzzle with the rammer, was in consequence the most exposed. However, we had no luck, for just as Trelawney fired, down he stooped, the ball whistling over him, and it was one of the other four who fell. The cry he gave was echoed not only by his companions on board, but by a great number of voices from the shore, and looking out in that direction I saw the other pirates trooping out from among the trees and tumbling into their places in the boats. "'Here come the gigs, sir,' said I. "'Give way, then,' said the captain. "'We mustn't mind if we swamp her now. If we can't get ashore, all's up.' "'Only one of the gigs is being manned, sir,' I added. "'The crew of the other is most likely going around by shore to cut us off.' "'They'll have a hot run, sir,' returned the captain. "'Jack ashore, you know. If it's not to them I mind, it's the round shot. "'Carpet bowls! My lady's maid couldn't miss. Tell us, squire, when you see the match, and we'll hold water.' In the meantime we had been making headway at a good pace for a boat so overloaded, and we had shipped but little water in the process. We were now close in. Thirty or forty strokes and we should beach her, for the ebb had already disclosed a narrow belt of sand below the clustering trees. The gig was no longer to be feared. The little point had already concealed it from our eyes. The ebb tide, which had so cruelly delayed us, was now making reparation and delaying our assailants. The one source of danger was the gun. "'If I durst,' said the captain, "'I'd stop and pick off another man.' It was plain that they meant nothing should delay their shot. They had never so much as looked at their fallen comrade, though he was not dead, and I could see him trying to crawl away. "'Ready!' cried the squire. "'Hold!' cried the captain, quick as an echo and he and Redruth backed with a great heave that sent her astern bodily under water. The report fell into the same instant of time. This was the first that Jim heard, the sound of the squire's shot not having reached him. When the ball passed, not one of us precisely knew, but I fancy it must have been over our heads, and that the wind of it may have contributed to our disaster. At any rate, the boat sunk by the stern, quite gently, in three feet of water, leaving the captain and myself facing each other on our feet. The other three took complete headers, and came up again drenched and bubbling. So far there was no great harm. No lives were lost, and we could wade ashore in safety. But there were all our stores at the bottom, and to make things worse, only two guns out of five remained in a state for service. Mine I had snatched from my knees and held over my head by a sort of instinct. As for the captain, he had carried his over his shoulder by a bandolier, and, like a wise man, lock uppermost. The other three had gone down with the boat. To add to our concern we heard voices already drawing near to us in the wood along the shore, and we had only the danger of being cut off from the stockade in our half-crippled state but the fear before us, whether, if Hunter and Joyce were attacked by half a dozen, they would have the sense and conduct to stand firm. Hunter was steady, that we knew. Joyce was a doubtful case. A pleasant, polite man for a valet, and to brush one's clothes, but not entirely fitted for a man of war. With all this in our minds we waded ashore as fast as we could, leaving behind us the poor jolly boat, and a good half of all our powder and provisions. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Narrative continued by the Doctor End of the first day's fighting We made our best speed across the strip of wood that now divided us from the stockade, and at every step we took the voices of the buccaneers rang nearer. 
Soon we could hear their footfalls as they ran, and the cracking of the branches as they breasted across a bit of thicket. I began to see we should have a brush for it in earnest, and looked to my priming. "'Captain,' said I, "'Trelawney is the dead shot. Give him your gun. His own is useless.' They exchanged guns, and Trelawney, silent and cool as he had been since the beginning of the bustle, hung a moment on his heel to see that all was fit for service. At the same time, observing Grey to be unarmed, I handed him my cutlass. It did all our hearts good to see him spit in his hand, knit his brows, and make the blade sing through the air. It was plain from every line of his body that our new hand was worth his salt. Forty paces farther we came to the edge of the wood, and saw the stockade in front of us. We struck the enclosure about the middle of the south side, and almost at the same time seven mutineers, Job Anderson the boatswain at their head, appeared in full cry at the southwestern corner. They paused, as if taken aback, and before they recovered not only the squire and I, but Hunter and Joyce from the blockhouse had time to fire. The four shots came in rather a scattering volley, but they did the business. One of the enemy actually fell, and the rest, without hesitation, turned and plunged into the trees. After reloading we walked down the outside of the palisade to see the fallen enemy. He was stone dead, shot through the heart. We began to rejoice over our good success, when just at that moment a pistol cracked in the bush and a ball whistled close past my ear, and poor Tom Redruth stumbled and fell his length on the ground. Both the squire and I returned the shot, but as we had nothing to aim at, it was probable we only wasted powder. Then we reloaded, and turned our attention to poor Tom. The captain and Gray were already examining him, and I saw with half an eye that all was over. I believe the readiness of our return volley had scattered the mutineers once more, for we were suffered without further molestation to get the poor old gamekeeper hoisted over the stockade and carried, groaning and bleeding, into the log-house. Poor old fellow! He had not uttered one word of surprise, complaint, fear, or even acquiescence from the very beginning of our troubles till now, when we had laid him down on the log-house to die. He had lain like a Trojan behind his mattress in the gallery. He had followed every order, silently, doggedly, and well. He was the oldest of our party by a score of years, and now, sullen, old, serviceable servant, it was he that was to die. The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. "'Be I going, doctor?' he asked. "'Tom, my man,' said I, "'you're going home.' "'I wish I had had a lick at em with the gun first. he replied. "'Tom,' said the squire, "'say you forgive me, won't you? "'Would that be respectful like from me to you, squire?' was the answer. "'Howsoever it be, amen.' After a little while of silence he said he thought somebody might read a prayer. "'It's the custom, sir,' he added apologetically, and not long after, without another word, he passed away. In the meantime the captain, whom I had observed to be wonderfully swollen about the chest and pockets, had turned out a great many various stores—the British colours, a Bible, a coil of stoutish rope, pen, ink, the log-book, and pounds of tobacco. He had found a longish fir-tree lying felled and cleared in the enclosure, and, with the help of Hunter, he had set it up at the corner of the log-house, where the trunks crossed and made an angle. Then, climbing up on the roof, he had with his own hand bent and run up the colours. This seemed mightily to relieve him. He re-entered the log-house and set about counting up the stores as if nothing else existed but he had an eye on Tom's passage for all that, and as soon as all was over came forward with another flag, and reverently spread it on the body. "'Don't you take on, sir,' he said, shaking the squire's hand. "'All's well with him. No fear for a hand that's been shot down in his duty to captain and owner. It mayn't be good divinity, 
but it's a fact. Then he pulled me aside. Dr. Livesey, he said, in how many weeks do you and Squire expect the consort? I told him it was a question not of weeks, but of months. That if we were not back by the end of August, Blandley was to send to find us, but neither sooner nor later. You can calculate for yourself, I said. Why, yes, returned the captain, scratching his head. And making a large allowance, sir, for all the gifts of Providence, I should say we were pretty close-hauled. How do you mean? I asked. It's a pity, sir, we lost that second load. That's what I mean, replied the captain. As for powder and shot, we'll do. But the rations are short, very short. So short, Dr. Livesey, that we're perhaps as well without that extra mouth. And he pointed to the dead body under the flag. Just then, with a roar and a whistle, a round shot passed high above the roof of the log house and plumped far beyond us in the wood. Oh, said the captain, blaze away. You've lit enough powder already, my lads. At the second trial the aim was better, and the ball descended inside the stockade, scattering a cloud of sand, but doing no further damage. "'Captain,' said the squire, "'the house is quite invisible from the ship. It must be the flag they're aiming at. Would it not be wiser to take it in?' "'Strike my colours!' cried the captain. "'No, sir, not I!' And as soon as he had said the word I think we all agree with him for it was not only a piece of stout, seemingly good feeling, it was a good policy besides, and showed our enemies that we despised their cannonade. All through the evening they kept thundering away. Ball after ball flew over or fell short, or kicked up the sand in the enclosure. But they had to fire so high that the shot fell dead and buried itself in the soft sand. We had no ricochet to fear and though one popped in through the roof of the log-house and out again through the floor, we soon got used to that sort of horse-play, and minded it no more than cricket. "'There is one good thing about all this,' observed the captain. "'The wood in front of us is likely clear. The ebb has made a good while. Our stores should be uncovered. Volunteers to go and bring in pork.' Gray and Hunter were the first to come forward. Well armed, they stole out of the stockade, but it proved a useless mission. The mutineers were bolder than we fancied, or they put more trust in Israel's gunnery, for four or five of them were busy carrying off our stores and wading out with them to one of the gigs that lay close by, pulling an oar or so to hold her steady against the current. Silver was in the stern-sheets in command, and every man of them was now provided with a musket from some secret magazine of their own. The captain sat down to his log, and here is the beginning of the entry. Alexander Smollett, Master. David Livesey, Ship's Doctor. Abraham Gray, Carpenter's Mate. John Trelawney, Owner. John Hunter. And Richard Joyce, owners, servants, landsmen, being all that is left faithful of the ship's company, with stores for ten days at short rations, came ashore this day, and flew British colours on the log-house in Treasure Island. Thomas Redruth, owner's servant, landsman, shot by the mutineers. James Hawkins, cabin boy. And at the same time I was wondering over poor Jim Hawkins' fate. A hail on the land side. "'Somebody hailing us,' said Hunter, who was on guard. "'Doctor, squire, captain, hello, Hunter, is that you?' came the cries. And I ran to the door in time to see Jim Hawkins, safe and sound, come climbing over the stockade. Okay, so, very sad. Redruth died. And, and that was sad. And it was great that Smollett had a Union Jack to put over him. That was very nice. There's also the moment where I do have to wonder if Robert Louis Stevenson, as a Scotsman, 
was kind of making fun of English by having Smollett be so stupid as to not take down the flag that the bad guys are aiming at when they have a nine-pound gun that they can aim at that structure. There, it was just too obvious, irksome. I have no other explanation for it. The fact that Livesey is like, right, that's the right attitude, sir. <laughs> don't, don't take down the flag that's going to get us all killed. No, queen and country want you to keep that flag. Huzzah. So, yeah, there is part of me that wonders if that wasn't just a maybe subtle or not so subtle thing. I don't know. Again, I am completely wide open on my interpretation here. I have no idea. Nobody else has written about this that I found. So we're all right. Yay. <laughs> I also love that it ends with Jim running up, which means both of our two storylines have reconvened. We have Jim and now Ben Gunn back with the gang. So that's kind of cool. And Trelawney, crack shot that he is, oh my gosh, he's actually useful. I love it. Now, one of the, the more, I thought, confusing portions of the narrative, actually, was when they were trying to get away from the Hispaniola. For one thing, there is exactly zero consensus on the size or the mounting of a long nine gun. It sounds like they thought there were two guns and they remembered one that might have been taken ashore, like a small cannon could have been taken ashore by the pirates. But no, I have combed through this book. It is just that long nine that Jim was fiddling with the first time he got on deck. He was playing with, and I'm quoting, the swivel, which means that that gun, the long nine, is mounted on something that allows it to swivel meaning you can aim it really well. Okay, there were lots of different kinds of cannons, and the long nine was definitely one of them. But the long nine means it was either, <laughs> depending on which expert you listen to, a five-foot-long bronze gun, a seven-foot-long cast-iron gun, or a slightly longer than nine-foot-long cast-iron gun. It shot four diameter balls, nine pounds each, a brass, just for comparison's sake, because I couldn't find any more detailed information on the long nine, and I hope somebody else has some because it's killing me. A brass six-pounder was 1,200 pounds. A long nine probably had somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 yards as its range. However, none of these munitions were particularly aimable. The fact that they could tell that a shot went over them means that Israel Hands really was a very good gunner. And chances are the long nine was mounted somewhere near the front of the boat so that as the Hispaniola is sailing after somebody, you could shoot at them. You'd shoot up in a high arc and you would be trying to aim ahead of where they were currently because they too are moving forward. This is what happened on the little jolly boat. They are rowing as fast as they can parallel to the shore because the tide has screwed up their whole plan. They are trying to get to shore to the stockade. It is not looking good. They see Israel hands undoing the tarp that's over the top of the, the long nine. Smollett asks Trelawney to watch for the match. That means he wants to know when they're about to light the fuse that is going to ignite the powder behind the ball that will then propel it into them. Trelawney has already picked off one of them. He doesn't hit hands, but he hits the guy next to him, which, again, this is a, he's shooting a musket, a gun without rifling, and he's that good. In wind, most likely, and on a moving little dinghy boat which is going to be bouncing up and down quite a bit. This is an impressive guy. So that was when they all had to lean one direction when Trelawney was firing one direction because the recoil from the gun was going to push in one direction. They, You know, these guys are smart. Smarter still, but sadly, not smart enough. 
was Smollett saying, watch for the match. Let me know. Trelawney cries, ready. The captain cries, hold. And he and Redruth backed with a great heave that sent her stern bodily underwater. What does that mean? It means that instead of rowing the direction that they are trying to row, the direction where the pointed end of the little boat, the jolly boat, would be going forwards, they reverse because they know that Israel Hands is aiming ahead of them. And if they stop going that direction, the ball's going to go over the top of them and not hurt them. Brilliant. Unfortunately, they were really strong and they did a really good job. And it means that that action of reversing course pushed the back of the boat down under the water that was already lipping at the gunwale. Once that surface tension is broken, once the water starts to come in, that's it. And that's how they lost so much. Guns, food, uh, it's just heartbreaking. Livesey, again, super smart guy, holds the gun over his head as he's going down, because he's smart. Smollett has the gun strapped to him, the reverse of what you would expect, so that the business end of it is dry. So they've at least got two guns. But still, that was, that was a lot of action that is happening in, I'm not joking, that is about 100 words. I'm going to go with 120 words. That's a lot. That's a lot of action to cram into that. That was what I was talking about with, it feels like Stevenson really was just flying. He was just going fast because he lets us go fast too, which is not to say that this episode has gone quickly because I know this is one of the longest we've ever done in an awfully long time. But I just, there was nowhere I could cut this. It was just going to be painful. And Livesey's only got these three chapters, so just put them together. And next week we'll get back to Jim and that'll be that. Next week we'll have more uh, voicemails as well. I hope voicemails from you too. Again, 206-350-1642 if you have something to say. And again, a huge thank you to Meredith for sending us the really cool information about her dad's book and game, their game in Danish. So cool. Oh, just love that. All right. Just a few links for you on the show notes, mostly fun stuff. And I'll talk to you next week. All right. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review at iTunes or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or any one of a million different places that Craftlet wound up over the last 13 years. For more information on Craftlet, you can visit craftlit.com and subscribe via your favorite podcast app or download the Craftlet app so you can get all of your episodes right there in your hand all in one place without having to hassle with anything else. So you can be sure not to miss any of Treasure Island. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thanks. <laughs>